Pursuant to Section 84.14.11 of the Nebraska Statutes, the next regular meeting of the Board of Education of Douglas County School District 001 and the Board of Educational Service Unit Number 19 will be held on Monday, October 15, 2018 at 6.30 p.m. in the Board Meeting Room of the Teacher Administrative Center, 3215 Cummings Street. The agenda be kept current and available for public inspection in the Office of the Secretary of the Board of Education at the Administrative Building during regular working hours. Pursuant to Section 84.14.12 of the Nebraska Statutes, the public is hereby informed that a current copy of Nebraska Open Meetings Act is posted in the board meeting room on the north wall. Please stand for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Also, thank you to the Color Guard, uh, the JROTC um, from Central High School. Vice President America will lead us in the OPS vision and mission statement. All right, first up is our vision, every student every day prepared for success, and our mission. Omaha Public Schools prepares all students to excel in college, career, and life. Thank you. Roll call, please. Cassidy. Here. 
Gotting. Present. Holman. Present. America. Present. Perlman. Here. Ryan. Present. Scanlon. Present. Smith. Here. Snow. Here. Nine present. Thank you. Moving on to school spotlight, Kayla Morrissey. Good evening, Board President Snow, members of the board, and Superintendent Dr. Logan. We are pleased to present Central High School's Junior Reserve Officers Training Corps Academic Team as tonight's OPS Proud Spotlight. In June, team members Alex Garbant, Anthony Bonner, Shar So, and Aiden Marhenke competed in the 2018 U.S. Army JROTC Academic Bowl Championship at the Catholic University of America in Washington, D.C. The team finished in 18th place nationally out of more than 1,700 Army JR JROTC programs. The academic bowl consists of questions on the ACT exam and is timed. We salute these students for their academic success at nationals and commend them for their hard work and preparation leading up to the competition. We now welcome Principal Dr. Bennett to the podium for remarks. Good evening, President Snow, members of the board, and Dr. Logan. Uh, at Central, we talk a lot about the Eagle ABCs, or Academics, Behavior, and Community. And there is no group that embodies the Eagle ABCs more than our JROTC students. Academically, you can tell they scored an 18th out of over 1,700 battalions across the country. From a behavior standpoint, they are outstanding. They dress beautifully. They know how to uh, present the colors. And that's not something you just see at a board meeting. That's how they handle themselves every day. From a community standpoint, they understand how to give more than they take by contributing hours of volunteer time, hours spending in the community, working with various groups, and representing Central in the best possible way. Uh, C also stands for coattails, which is what I get to ride when they show up after doing so well. So at this time, it's my great privilege, privilege to uh, welcome to the podium Lieutenant Colonel Mike Melvin and our JROTC team. Thank you, Dr. Bennett, President Snow, members of the board, and Dr. Logan, thank you for having us tonight. Uh, these four individuals started their journey about a year ago, where when they entered level one against 1,700 schools nationwide, they qualified uh, during that competition and then moved on to level two uh, in February. And then again, they were tested and they placed second in a 10 state region which won them a, an all-expense-paid trip to Washington, D.C., to Catholic University of America, where they competed over three days, nine different tests, and they ended up 18th. We are so proud of these individuals. And President Snow, if you would help me uh, present the medals that they earned from the George C. Marshall Foundation. And these are medals for academic and leadership excellence. Thank you. I'm going to invite Dr. Logan to join me as well. I thought I'd get them out of here without any questions, but I guess not. <laughs> uh, let, let me tell you, uh, 
a little bit about their preparation. Yes. They started in, in uh, about the 1st of October studying ACT type questions. They used ACT prep. Uh, did They met after school uh, during the weekends. They worked really hard to get, get prepared. Now, they're ready for your questions. They've been through the tough ones. Well, thank you guys so much. If you can just go through real quick and say your, uh, uh, introduce yourself and, and um, what grade you in and something that we don't know about you or about this experience. Rank, Rank I apologize. <laughs> My name is Charso. I'm, I'm a senior this year. I'm the BCO. Battalion Commander. <laughs> I'm the Battalion Commander. Hi, I'm Anthony Bonner. I am a senior this year, and I am the Battalion Executive Officer. I'm Aiden Marhinke. I am um, a senior this year, and I am the Battalion S1. My name is Alex Garbrandt. I am a junior, and I am the uh, Battalion's Male Supply Officer. Thank you. Mr. Scanlon. Uh, just out of curiosity, I was in the military. Are any of you uh, looking to transition from uh, JROTC into uh, serving the country? If you could come to the podium and... <laughs> yes, sir, I am. What, uh, what are you uh, interested in? I'm particularly interested in the Army. I hope to... Um, I hope to study at NYU Shanghai during my service to um, become fluent in Chinese and study accounting and finances to lead a business in this new world. I got nothing after that. <laughs> <laughs> Best of luck. <laughs> Mrs. Godding. Well, congratulations to all of you. You've done really, really well. So one of the questions um, that we were chatting about before the meeting was, did this help you prepare for the ACT, or do you think you'll take the ACT again or take other testing? Um, did you find it helpful in preparing? Um, it did help prepare for the ACT, but I probably will take it again. But it was a lot of, it was a lot of help. Um, we did a lot of weekend practice, and we kind of had to coordinate with ourselves time so we could do these things, but in, in the end, we did it. So. Well, I'm impressed because that really speaks to your dedication that you would spend the weekend studying and pr doing practice tests and all of that. Can you share with us one um, memorable funny moment, maybe, or humorous experience as you were going through the competition? I think... My favorite uh, moment of this competition was uh, following the announcement that we did not make it into the uh, finalist playoffs, like the joint service competition between the four, or yeah, the five branches competing. Um, there was a team from Florida who's, they blew my mind with the range of their academic knowledge. Um, the question went something like, we have an octodecimal for you, and then they gave a sequence of numbers in Fullerton before they finished um, saying the question, hit the buzzer, and gave the answer 81. And they said, that is correct. Cut to two minutes later, and they ask, what, yeah, a, mar a maggot is the larva of what insect? 15, 20 seconds later, Captain, I need an answer. So they hit the buzzer reluctantly and say, bees? That was my favorite funny moment. <laughs> that, that is great. So they were really good at math, but maybe not so much at science. <laughs> very, very good. Well, did you also get to do some sightseeing while you were in DC? We were able to do some sightseeing, and also during the, uh, while we were out for the three days, they did give us a day to where there was a sightseeing tour, where they gave us a specific time, I think it was, I believe it was around eight hours just to explore the National Mall area, which was a beautiful place to go to. Well, wonderful. What a great opportunity for all of you, and congratulations again. Can I make a quick plug for Central Foundation? 
uh, we had the opportunity to go a day early and go to a, a Washington Nationals game, and they picked up the tab for that. So we're that very, awesome. very appreciative of uh, the uh, Central High School Foundation. Thank you. I want to make a quick note, too. All of this <laughs> doesn't happen without great leadership, and Colonel Melvin has done an absolutely outstanding job uh, with our battalion. He's helped by Sergeant Major Dwayne Sutter, who's not here this evening. But uh, you will not find two better instructors, better people, better educators, and better uh, colleagues than those two. So well done. Thank you. And I, I see some other staff from Central as well as I see some parents in the audience. If you guys could all please stand and be recognized. Uh, give you guys a round of applause. You're fine men and women. Uh, thank you guys so much. Thank you so much. Shake. Oh, I forgot about that. I apologize. Please come around and we'd like to shake your hand and congratulate you again. Thank you again, Colonel Melvin. Moving on to Board and Superintendent Communications, Dr. Logan. Good evening, President Snow and Board of Education and uh, folks in here in the audience. I'd like to start my remarks by congratulating Central High School seniors. It's a trifecta for uh, Central tonight. Rosalie Doherty, Hudson Hooper, and Williams Folos for being selected as National Merit semifinalists in the National Merit uh, Scholarship Program uh, by the National Merit Scholarship Corporation. These students now have the opportunity to continue in the competition for 7,500 scholarships worth more than $31 million. Also, Central, actually uh, another uh, recognition for Central, Congratulations to Central High School teacher Scott Wilson for being selected as a finalist for Nebraska Teacher of the Year by the Nebraska Department of Education. The National Teacher of the Year program began in 1952 as a means of recognizing outstanding teachers. The Nebraska Teacher of the Year program has been in place since 1972 and is sponsored by the National Nebraska Council of School Administrators. The committee reviews all of the application and selects five Award of Excellence teachers. Uh, which Mr. Scott is one, and they will go through a final uh, interview process. Actually, that interview process happened last, uh, last Saturday. Last week, we celebrated Omaha Education Week, uh, which was kicked off by the annual brex breakfast hosted by OSAA. Some highlights for the week were ribbon-cutting ceremonies for major renovations, additions, and upgrades at Norris and Oak Valley Middle School. Thanks again to Omaha voters for their support of the district. There was also a ribbon cutting at Crest Ridge for an outdoor classroom made possible through a generous grant from the Sherwood Foundation. Another exciting event last week uh, was at, held at UNO. They hosted all 4,000 of our eighth graders for future MAV Day. It was a spectacular opportunity to see our students receive information on what it will take them to be ready for college in five years. Thanks to our counseling departments and all of our middle schools for their support of this program. The last event for the week was at the Children's Museum, uh, which was for staff, which included free admission for our staff and their own children due to a generous grant from business and community partners. It was a treat to see staff relaxing on a Friday with their own little people and if the crying uh, when it was time to leave is any indicator, <laughs> the kiddos had a good time. 
And uh, my final note is uh, happy birthday to Ben Perlman. Many happy returns. This concludes my report. I'm sure you are excited to be here on your birthday. National channel, oh, yes, indeed. Uh, moving on to board members. Um, Mrs. Gotti. I was able to be at the Norris ribbon cutting, and I just want to say what a great job was done, I, you know, really by everyone involved in that project. What an incredible change to the facility. It was just um, amazing to see the inside now compared to what it was like even. 10 months ago, practically. So it's pretty pretty exciting. Also, I just want to make sure that everyone in um, Omaha knows that Dr. Logan will be at Burke for an open house. Um, and it's really the dedication of the new gymnasium area. This Thursday, before the big football game that Burke will play, so all community members are certainly invited to attend with their families to take a tour and to be able to meet Dr. Logan. Um, out at Burke, so I wanted to make sure everyone knew that. Mr. Perlman. I just wanted to um, take a minute to thank all the staff and, and Dr. Logan for their work with everything that happened at the Yale apartment complex. I know uh, we're all still thinking about those families and, and the things that they're still going through, but uh, I visited both of those um, <coughs> community centers and uh, they uh, told me all of the hard work that, that, uh, that Dr. Logan, yourself, Mr. Ray, Travis Salas, who's, who's out here tonight, and Lisa Utterback, uh, all the work, and, and I'm sure other staff members did to help all those families. Just want to take a moment to recognize all that hard work, and um, yeah, that's all. Thanks. I would like to just give them a round of applause for that, too. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Not in the job description, but you know they really care. So thank you so much. Mrs. Cassidy. Thank you. Um, I want to piggyback off uh, Mr. Perlman. Um, I also want to not forget to include the Omaha Public Schools Foundation in all of their work um, in also aiding with the Yale Park Apartments. Um, I think that we got an email today that said the initial fundraising effort between um, our district and the um, foundation, I think the initial goal was, goal was 40,000 40, and it, we exceeded it by 16,000. So I think that's, I don't know if that's the final number, but um, I think that's, that's close, that's close. So great effort by everyone involved. Um, it just truly needed and I think it shows how much our community came together and um, really have done what they need to do to take care of our, our Omaha Public School families. Um, one other note with the Omaha Public Schools Foundation, I promised them that I would not forget to give this little housekeeping tidbit. Um, they have an open house. They've moved to this year, if you are not aware. Um, they are now on 38th and Farnham in the Blackstone District, and they are hosting an open house. Um, they have kind of an invite going out over email, but a um, little bit worried that certain groups are not getting that email. So um, I told them that I would make sure to shout out tonight that all community members are involved, administrators, anyone in the community that would like to come. Um, it is Wednesday, October 10th from 4 to 7 p.m. Just light refreshments and a great chance to come see the new building and to find out a little bit more about what the foundation does, all the great um, efforts and fundraising that they provide for the students of our district, um, field trips, countless, countless things that our students do every day that is funded by the um, Omaha Public Schools Foundation. So if you are around the Blackstone District on October 10th, stop by. That's it. Vice President America. Um, kind of echoing off of that I did want to also say thank you to our staff and community members that donated to the OPSF fundraiser for the students that were living in the Yellow Park apartments because I saw um, watching after the information was first put out I saw a lot of staff members taking time to share it with their networks and then people who don't even live in the Omaha area but just were impacted by everything that was going on sharing it to spread the word to build that support for our students so I think it's it's a tragic situation that it occurred but it does show how much our community cares and supports for all of our students 
Um, I also promised that I would give a shout out tonight because um, this is our last board meeting before this happens. On Sunday, October 14th, um, Brian High is hosting its 19th annual car show. Um, when it originally started, it was hosted by the band to benefit the band and orchestra. Some other groups took it over in the middle, but it is now again being hosted by their band and orchestra program. Um, so it's a benefit for buying new instruments um, and building up their band program. Um, and that is that Sunday from 9 to 4. If you have a car you'd like to enter, you can register that from 8 to noon. Thank you. Sorry, much better. Uh, the next item on the agenda is public comment. We have one speaker who has submitted a request to speak form. Uh, the board has adopted policy 8346, which provides public comment for a period of one hour. That same policy limits individual speakers to a maximum of five minutes. We ask that you respect that time limit. Mr. Ray will let you know when you have one minute remaining, when you have 30 seconds remaining. If you are in need of an interpreter, uh, please let Mr. Ray know one will be provided for you. If the subject of your public comment is related to a particular student or staff member, we ask that you not mention the student or staff member by name and instead provide that information to Mr. Ray. He will assist us in looking at those types of details for you. If you, do not, if you do not get an opportunity to speak and would like to submit any written commentary, please provide it to Mr. Ray. He will make sure each board member gets a copy. As a reminder, we ask that you please spell your name and state your address before you begin your public comment. It is 656. Larry Storer. Just because you're the only speaker, you don't get the full hour, just FYI. <laughs> I was wondering that on the way down. <laughs> I'm not going to punish you that way. <laughs> Thank you. Larry Storer, 5015 Lafayette Avenue, Omaha, Nebraska, 68132, Omaha Police School District for since 1971. My reasons tonight are for transparency, but also educational, I think. Uh, I remember back about 1960, maybe a little earlier, that I had a journalism class. And there were like six or seven, eight questions that they beat into us to get to the meat of a story with accuracy, such as uh, what, when, why, how, who, how much, and for how long. I think that applies to a lot of things going on, uh, not only in our country, but at our state legislature and in the Omaha Public School District. Uh, everybody's common sense is different, I suppose, but I do want to thank you for at least not telling us on your documents that we can only comment on things not on the agenda and then only as it pertains to such and such. This, this opens it up for us, however, how many people can get down here within five minutes after this meeting starts and read the agenda and decide what they want to comment on, particularly when there's nothing but a sentence about the topics? How many citizens have the time to go onto a website to find out what those topics mean? So what I'd suggest is maybe putting in the middle of your meeting a, a short comment period and one at the end for people that maybe don't want to sit for the whole meeting, but want to hear what you're talking about before they comment, because they didn't have a chance to find out what you're going to talk about. And that leads me to uh, part of the educational process I believe that we need in Omaha. There have been some recent events in uh, revolving helping refugees, which I'm not against. But I think there's a lot of questions coming up that the public doesn't know yet how many they're going to ask because we don't know a lot about the K apartment situation. We don't know how far in advance that the school board knew that they needed to gather a bunch of school buses. We don't know why the school board was asked to do that instead of city buses. Uh, we don't know how far in advance 
the other city officials knew that this was going to happen, but it was obviously very well planned, coordinated, and executed, which implies there was some forethought to all this, which implies some questions ought to be asked about who had the foresight. Or did they simply come, for example, to the school board president uh, and say, you need to do this. You need to do this for the children. You need to do this for the youth. But did they give you time to think it out? There's maybe possibly some very serious constitutional questions involved in all this. Some of it's been asked on public radio recently, including this afternoon. So tune in and wait for other questions from other people because I think it's going to be somewhat of a controversy. I'm not against helping people and, and neither is an organization such as MOPA, Metropolitan Property Owners Association, who have had some experience with these things in the past. One uh, minute. Things being done without proper time notice, without proper questions. And let, let's slow down and not do these kind of things before you think it out. Thank you. Thank you. And just for the public, um, the meeting is published online uh, that Thursday. We usually try to get out that Thursday afternoon, but by Friday morning, you should typically be able to go to our website and look at the full uh, meeting agenda, be able to click on read attachments, um, and uh, fully gather as much information that you need before the meeting, which allows you to make your public comment before we begin our meeting. Moving on to the consent agenda, I will now entertain a motion to approve the consent agenda that is before us. So moved. Second. We have a motion by Ms. Ryan, second by Mrs. Godding. Any abstentions? Roll call, please. Godding. Aye. Hallman. Aye. America. Aye. Perlman. Aye. Ryan. Aye. Scanlon. Aye. Smith. Aye. Snow. Aye. Cassidy. Aye. Nine aye. Motion carries. Moving on to we have no action items today. Um, we do have uh, some information items. Uh, moving on to J2A K12 Comprehensive Math Plan. Melissa Comine. Good evening. Thank you, President Snow, Vice President Merica, members of the board, and Superintendent Dr. Logan. I appreciate the opportunity to give you an update on the K-12 Comprehensive Math Plan. The Math Task Force, which was formed last school year, came together to provide guidance, feedback, and recommendations for the K-12 Comprehensive Math Plan. This group of teachers, administrators, and also community members reviewed the plan. They also revised the OPS mathematics mission, vision, 13 goals, and also prioritized four priority goals for this school year. The four priority goals for this school year are to increase teacher use of identified best instructional mathematics practices in all classrooms, to engage teachers and instructional leaders in routine coaching conversations, to increase teachers collaborating amongst their colleagues, and to build the capacity of building leaders to implement and sustain a high quality math program. These goals are supported by math research from the National Council of Teachers Mathematics, Principles to Actions, Growth Mindset from Carol Dweck, Mathematical Mindset from Joe Bowler and John Hattie's Invisible Learning. These four priority goals are driving the work the math team is doing with the district leaders, principals, teachers, and the community. The four goals are interdependent, and when they are implemented with fidelity, there is a synergy 
with knowledgeable leaders coaching teachers who collaborate with each other to plan for and implement best practices. CIS is currently working with the research department to design tools for measuring progress towards these goals. We know change takes time and we are structuring support to ensure ample support gets to the classroom level where it is and has the greatest impact. This diagram shows how information is shared among various colleagues and groups to create a systemic impact to support change in mathematics behavior and practice. The math team provides professional development to the curriculum and instruction support department, executive directors, principals, and other building leaders. And then CIS principals and other building leaders are all resp responsible for providing professional development, coaching, and support to teachers. Everyone plays a role in ensuring the success of all students and believes that we are better together. This team approach supports the priority goals of increasing the use of identified best instructional mathematic practices and also to support building the capacity of our building leaders to implement and sustain a high quality math program. At the Summer Principal Institute last May, we informed all principals of the K-12 Comprehensive Math Plan, the goals and the work of the task force. It was reinforced and made clear that math was a district focus for the 18-19 school year. This allowed principals to embed math as a major focus into their school improvement plans. During the August Curriculum Day, Growth Mindset was a required session for all elementary teachers and secondary math teachers. And as a result, we have seen an increased focus on growth mindset in math and across all dis disciplines. School and classroom cultures are improving as teachers and students embrace the power of knowing that we are not there yet, but we can continue to learn and improve. The topic of growth mindset was chosen as our starting point as the task force believes in the research supports that an effective math program requires the belief that all students can learn at the highest levels. During the September curriculum day, all elementary teachers, secondary math teachers, and building leaders receive professional learning on productive struggle. We know that students must be given opportunities to investigate mathematical concepts and persevere through challenging tasks, and this is very closely tied to growth mindset. In the coming months, professional learning with district and building leaders will focus on math discourse and multiple representations and methods. In the second semester, we will go deeper with all of these topics. At this time, the opportunity to provide consistent professional development opportunities focused on math has led to increased awareness across the district around best practices of mathematics. We also have additional professional learning that we are offering. Uh, the ongoing assessment project, most commonly known as OGAP. We have two teachers from every elementary building and one from each middle school, and they are being trained to look deeply at formative assessment and consider how to move stu students forward on their trajectory. There are also optional opportunities for staff members to be trained on Saturdays and after school as requested by secondary buildings. We are sponsoring four parent math nights for parents and uh, students K through eight. These are grade level specific and focus on the teaching and learning happening each quarter in the elementary through eighth grade classrooms. These parent meetings are one way we are embracing the OPS math vision of partnering with family and community. The Stanford Mathematics Mindset course, we have over 40 teachers who have taken this course it focuses on brain science and mindset research, along with the teaching strategies for increasing math motivation and achievement and practices for assessment and grading. We have also partnered with national consultants, Matt Larson at the high school level and John San Giovanni at the elementary level to provide various professional development topics aligned to our goals and our math plan. The Metropolitan Omaha Educational Consortium, also known or most notably known as MOEC, is doing a year-long professional learning community workshop around mathematics for high schools. And they are focusing on math PLCs at work. And we have teachers and principals from four of our high schools partnering with nine other districts in this work. Um, this is not a comprehensive list of our optional PDs, but these and other professional learning opportunities are providing our teachers and building leaders with choice as it relates to their specific school improvement plan and individual needs. 
At each of our district-wide monthly professional developments, our leaders are charged with monthly math missions, which involves them going back to their classrooms and getting into math classrooms to see what to see what professional learning that has occurred is happening in classrooms. Um, they have already seen and documented some of these instructional shifts in math practices. And so on the screen, you're gonna see various tweets from teachers and building administrators. This first tweet, our first tweet is from an elementary classroom where students are understanding and learning from each other. And so they're using multiple uh, representations and methods and also using um, productive struggle and so you can see that students were quoted as saying I used my cubes or I drew a picture and then obviously they were having conversation about their learning the second tweet is also is from an elementary supervisor um, representing growth mindset it's the student recognizing when they have difficulties taking a test and coming up with a strategy to overcome their struggles so they can be successful on the test the next one is around mathematics language and thinking and communicating clearly and analyzing and evaluating, which falls with our productive struggle and also our discourse. And then the final example is a middle school um, where CK says, I heard amazing math talk today. I heard students do more talk than their teacher. Students who engage in more discussion than their teachers are the ones who learn and love his hashtags. No more sit and get. We embrace productive struggle, growth mindset, and we start with the problem and not modeling. So these tweets are documenting early on for us the my milestones for the changes we are seeing in classrooms. They show that our building leaders are monitoring the instructional expectations while celebrating successes as well. We know that the INSCAS was a new assessment in the spring of 2018 last year, and our students were tested over the new math standards for the first time. We are looking forward to receiving our baseline data in December of this year. We do know that change will not happen overnight. Our focus is on improving the teaching and learning at the classroom level. It is an equity issue, and we believe that all students need to have access to high quality math instruction, and a plan is only words on paper unless it propels action in all classrooms. This means we must move from pockets of excellence to systemics, um, systemic excellence that supports the learning of all students and we do feel that we are on the right path moving math forward and greatly appreciate that it's not just a CIS focus but it is a district math focus for this school year so that is a quick update for you thank you <clears throat> first um, before we open it up for the entire board could you elaborate on the equity issue uh, and how it is so important to the district and to your your department and so when we talk about equity, we're talking about all students learning high with high quality math and ensuring that the instructional strategies that we use meet each and every student. And so there are some um, little things that teachers may have been aware of. Maybe I only call on students on one side of the room or I only call on students who know the answer, but really encouraging teachers that we teach every student. You need to know where every student is and you need to challenge every student and help them grow. So it's around that thinking and the rigor. Thank you. I'll open up for comments. Mr. Smith. Um, I see the ongoing assessment project. I uh, had a question. Is there teacher evaluation to identify our teachers who have strengths and, and a good skill set to continue working with these kids? So we're constantly looking at all of our math classrooms and taking a look at all of the the capacity level of our teachers and moving them forward to do better. So one of the things that we are doing with the research departments, we're developing tools that will help us measure our four priority goals for this school year. So we would look at every classroom and every teacher. Mrs. Gotting. So I'm very interested in as you know, the measuring progress and, and all of that. Um, clearly our kids have just kind of finished up, probably most of them are done with the map testing. Is that a, our baseline or? So our baseline will be the INSCAS assessment okay. from last spring. Okay. For the INSCAS, yes. Okay. So my question is um, how often, because was it, were they called CIR? 
what were the old the CRTs? assessments, CRTs mm -hmm. that we used to do? Is that similar to what we're moving back to as a formative assessment on a regular basis to kind of see progress? Or can you share with us what the formative assessment process will look like throughout the year? So the INSCAS is not similar to the CRTs. The INSCAS replaced the NISA assessment, mm -hmm. which students will take in the spring, and it will measure um, their proficiency, and then eventually will help us measure some growth as well. So the states and NWEA are still working out some of those details. But the data that we should get would, should look pretty similar to what we saw in reading last year, mm -hmm. a new baseline. So students are tested on the new standards. We should see a significant drop in our math scores because we're creating a new baseline. So when you take a look at formative assessment, there's a lot of different ways you can assess students. Mm -hmm. The most important way is moment by moment, mm -hmm. teachers knowing where every student is in their classroom. Right. And then you can move on from there. You have your quick checks for understanding. You can have your assessments. One of the things that we have are common assessments for teachers. And so this year at the elementary level, it's the first time instead of the students taking the unit test, the supervisors worked with teachers and created common assessments. And the common assessments were built off of the standards of what every student needs to know and be able to do, but also the level of difficulty so that we can help our teachers understand our standards, we can help them know what the students are being assessed on, and then work backwards to determine what is it that I really need to be teaching our students. Thank you so much because that's really where I was okay. wondering, well, how do we get from what everybody should know based on the state standards to where we need to be. And for whatever reason, I always felt like the old formative testing we did kind of was all built around the standards that, and every school had the right. same test and it was all very comparable. Um, I know that I've had a conversation with a couple different people related to map testing and the opportunity for kids to work um, to load those test scores into Khan Academy and work at home on that. Is that something that's happening or is it something we're telling parents, hey, if you want to help your child improve their math skills? Because it should be, I mean, in general, mm -hmm. at every grade right. level, we should So be what I would recommend is we need parents to come to our quarterly math nights because the focus is on specifically what students are learning each quarter in school. Um, the math map test, we're in our second year. Last year, the goal for the district was to get teachers familiar with pulling map reports. And then this year, they're becoming more familiar with how to use the data to make instructional decisions. Okay. okay. And so I think the more focused approach to supporting kids is best. So we really need parents to be there, be involved, yes. and learn about all the opportunities they can help their children at home with on improving test scores yes and just improving their knowledge it's not about taking a test it's about gaining the knowledge that gives you the confidence when you go to take a test exactly so okay I want to address the Khan Academy uh, issue because I think that that's something that we also knew need to do a better job probably around the country <laughs> of letting our parents know the um, so for kids students who take the PSAT once the when you, when you get your result from the PSAT they give you a pretty detailed report um, that is linked to Khan Academy and the areas where you need to uh, where students need to improve uh, domain by domain um, in the on the math side and then with the links to the Khan Academy that that correlate to each of those um, also with the PSAT they also give you when you get your result they also give you um, a guide for if you want to increase your score that this is about exactly how long you need to probably concentrate on each one of those areas I'm getting nods from all the college people here at the table um, for to to increase your score so that is an underutilized resource um, likely because here in the Midwest we also use the ACT is used so heavily uh, it is a great resource um, the PSAT and it's interesting because I know I have a meeting with Susan uh, soon and that's one thing I'm going to be talking about and I know Susan is already very very familiar with it um, but I um, that's also something that we can um, probably work with our parents more and actually what I've seen the most is when students take 
the best results, rather, is when students really take agency around using that tool. Um, I remember a young uh, woman, a uh, young lady, who came to see, happened to just end up in the chief academic officers and had a question, and she didn't know she was going to get all that attention, but um, was really able to, and then we were saying, she was kind of talking about her score, and they said, well, she says, no, I actually, I want, I'm willing to put the two hours in, you know, a week to may have my score get, she already had a pretty high score, as you could imagine, because she was a student with a lot of agency, um, and, you know, really wanted to have a seven, she was really rooting for something in, in the 700 range. So um, that's another um, way that we can also, and when you talk about um, the opportunity to use what really is uh, uh, not necessarily a formative assessment, which is you know, the SAT or any of the ACT, but to um, use it as a formative for our young people. And it is my understanding that we can use Khan Academy with pre-ACT as well. So that's something Susan and Scott schmidt Bonnie would have more information on. So right. So and I, that, I want to piggyback on that. That's a conversation I've been having with last year's sophomores for the last year. And obviously my child at home has been drilled heavily on are those scores in Khan Academy and how many tests you know, have you gotten and so what what has disappointed me from the district standpoint is that we haven't as a guidance office shared that out district-wide and yet I know that that's happening with other school districts in the uh, metro area so I would just encourage us to really get on top of that that's a disappointment to me that we could really see improvements um, I talked to one young woman who I think she raised her SAT score 800 points. I think she was from Florida and was able to get, uh, do you remember that? Eight Division I scholarships in track. And that, the only thing holding her back was her S SAT score. Her track record was incredible, but she needed that SAT. And we have kids who um, are dedicated enough to put that time in, just like we saw tonight. So thank you for hopping right on that I appreciate it it is a really powerful underutilized tool so that's something that's so noted we always can we always know about upgrades and uh, we certainly will be taking that forward thank you mrs. Cassidy thank you. Um, I'm going to shift a little bit to talking and speaking more on the elementary level um, I want to applaud you on the parent math nights I think that that's a critical piece um, the elementary level is such a formative time um, as far as math goes. The foundation has to be there. I have elementary children, so I can say that um, parent math nights are a great step in the right direction. Um, as a parent that cringes when I have to help with math at night, I pray my husband's home because I'm not not the best at math, so I'm always excited when he can help this my students. But um, can you explain a little more and touch base a little more what those parent math nights will? What will they look like? What will they? entail so and how the, often the next one is October 30th at Bryan High School we had our first one uh, September 18th it was a Tuesday and so it focus there's one per each quarter and it focuses it's by grade level so if you have a fourth grade student you're going to get to come and see what your fourth grade student is going to learn at each quarter and so it's very hands-on the idea came from the from actually parent and community input at one of the DCAC meetings last year we did a presentation um, to our parents around math and they said we want to learn more around what our students are learning every day in the classroom and so this gives them an opportunity not just to learn it but actually experience it and how to actually solve different problems and I think we have a parent that came last uh, time that might be willing to do some videos and some advertising for us to get more parents there. In addition to um, them learning the curriculum and what their students will be, will there be um, anything provided for parents that might need additional resources on where to go? <laughs> So one of the things that um, the math team did do is they walked away with there's different resources that they created and so parents can actually take away here are some different things that you can do with your children here are some different um, appropriate uh, resources whether it be a website or a game or something like that as well and we have a lot that go with our go math resource itself and so that's where a majority of those are coming from we just found out that parents didn't know that they existed and so we needed to do a better job of sharing those resources with them. Uh, Dr. Holman. 
you both hit on the two points that I was going to make, but I remember specifically um, being at the at the meetings last year and at two different meetings, parents were um, sharing their frustrations with not understanding, being able to understand the math problems even at the early elementary levels um, and not being able to help them in the manner that they needed to help their children. And so um, it's very exciting to hear that you're going to have these, these math nights. And um, I'll be honest, I guess as a mom, I didn't even know that that it had started. Um, so how, how was this information being communicated to the public in regards to when the meetings are? So we've sent information home through school buildings. Mm -hmm. uh, we've also done some social media, but one of the things that we are doing after, we wanted, there was a lot of um, enthusiasm around the first one and we were a little nervous. We might be overwhelmed with the number of people coming. And so uh, when we realize we can actually accommodate everybody, we're actually setting up a communication plan with our district communications to get the word out even more. Perfect. That'd be great. And then um, also will it be announced at the next I don't know if it's the first DCAC meeting or, or the, the second first one, one, but the first, first one. Okay, one's I think it's 10th. next week. It's yeah, October it is next 10th week. Mm -hmm. We can Tactical. announce it. We're trying to announce it any way and every way we can. Perfect. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Perlman. Up. Oh. Mr. Scanlon. Uh, thank you for asking about the communication piece because I, I don't recall ever hearing about it, and um, I think anybody that's ever helped their child or that got help from their parents the you're doing it wrong the math um, is a reoccurring theme because I guess you know we're changing the ways we teach math but uh, you know the answer is always still the same uh, I've got a couple of questions um, sat through uh, some math presentations before I know you're new as the uh, head of um, curriculum education or the uh, academics um, does this new comprehensive math plan teach to the test or do we have something that is teaching the fundamentals so when the state changes their test we won't see a decline a drastic decline like we have before uh, in our uh, students test scores so th we teach to our standards and then we'd have curriculum materials that help our teachers meet those standards. So the question around the test, the test is designed to become more rigorous. It's designed to create a new baseline. It's designed to have a large dip in scores. If you take a look back at the history, it happens every time. And so every seven years, our state is required to do a standards revision process at the state level in all five content areas. And then they also have other cycles for other areas. And with that comes new standards, which are more rigorous. Now they're called the college and career ready standards, which are more difficult. And then when you take a look at um, how the test is scored, it's also more difficult. So here's an example. Um, and Scott, if you have a better example, you can feel free to share. So when students took the NISA, they could meet the expectation or exceed the expectation to pass the test. The score now to meet the expectation, you would have had to have a similar score that a student was exceeding the expectation. So not only did we move standards down because the college and career ready standards, we had a lot of eighth grade standards moved down and now taught in sixth grade and in fifth grade and in fourth grade. So that created complexities and rigor, but then we put a much more difficult scale on our students to actually pass the test. So th there's a lot of complex um, dynamics going on with the end goal of if you're familiar with the bell curve where you have a small percentage on the left side, majority of people fall in the middle, a small, a small percentage on the right side. The goal is to move that whole bell curve to the right to make our world more intelligent so that we can continue to think critically, that we can innovate, we can be creative. And so there's a lot of different things that go into that. It's not what can you do to ensure that scores don't go down. That's what the test is designed to do. Well, and I guess I asked that question because I think we lose quite a few students uh, away from our district because you know our test scores are 
I think the last ones we got for some subjects were in the 40s, maybe 50 percentage, 50 percent of our students. And I mean, we got to find a way to, to, I guess, minimize that. Otherwise, we're going to continue to have people criticize our district that, hey, look, you guys only have half your kids um, that are passing. Um, so I guess I would hope that we can come up with a way to to figure out how to minimize that and, and then throw our hands up and say well you know the test changed and then we get criticized for you know well maybe we're just teaching to the test so I think it's I think it's also us telling our story of our successes so for example last year the research department did some research for us and three percent of the population um, is taking higher level math courses across the nation, but in OPS we had 7%. And so that's a piece of the story to tell. Um, if we want to take a look at how our students are performing, let's take a look at like districts across the nation to see how they're performing. So I think that there's a lot of the story to be told to help people understand because it's not about the test either at the end. I know that there, yes, the test makes a difference, but it's about our kids learning and so it's about our kids succeeding and most importantly it's about our kids when they leave us at 12th grade that they're successful and they can go out and have either go on to college or ha have a working living wage to be successful so I think there's a lot of different pieces that we have to take into consideration and my final question is how is this going to be different I mean we've we've sat up here we've heard go math we've heard a bunch of different strategies we always seem to be shifting strategies, which obviously uh, you need to um, adapt and come up with the best plan moving forward. But how is this going to be different and how is this going to be successful? So this focuses in on the, the latest research. We need our kids not to be, kids need to know their facts. But our kids need to be able to think. They need to be problem solvers. They need to be constructivists. They need to know how to attack problems and attack the world. And this is what this is focusing on. When you talk about math mindsets, even the belief that one can learn, but also the belief, talking about the equity question that Mr. Snow had, the belief that our teachers and our schools believe that every student can learn. That's an equity issue that we believe in our kids and that we can instill the belief in our kids. When we talk about productive struggle, it's engaging kids in the right task at the right level so that all kids can be successful and they can think at high levels and not just giving them a two plus two equals four. When we talk about multiple methods and representations, it's equifinality. It's allowing students to attack problems in different ways and allows every student that equitable response. Some of them, their answers are going to be more sophisticated. Some of them may be more surface level. But every student in that classroom can get better and become more sophisticated and become more intelligent in being a constructivist in math to be successful. And so, if I mean, it depends on you talked about, you know, is the, the answers important, but how you get to that answer is sometimes more important depending on if we're trying to create the next engineer or if we're trying to create the next person to go out and create whatever it may be. Mr. Perlman. Yes, I just want to <clears throat> thank you for trying, you know, another approach. I know no approach is perfect, but um, when I hear comments about, you know, families leaving the district because of test scores, I think it only perpetuates a, a myth uh, that is damaging to our district. I don't know any other district in the metro area that has a number of immigrants or refugees who are asked to take these tests. I don't know any other district uh, in this metro area that has hundreds of families displaced with no place to live and are required to take these tests. So it's important to look at like districts and, um, you know, some of the challenges that uh, so many of our, our students uh, face that are uh, more complex than uh, students in some of the neighboring districts, not to take away anything from those other districts, but um, there are uh, challenges in this district that are unique to this district. And um, I, I wouldn't, I don't know many people fleeing the district because of our test scores. So just want to make that comment. And, and assuming everyone's, so I, just to wrap this up, because I know you've been sitting in the hot seat for a minute. Um, it's been a while since we've gotten an update, so this is good and healthy. Um, so real quick, um, 
what are the benchmarks and what is the timeline on coming back with uh, where we currently are and, and in essence of how are we going to assess these to see if they're effective? Dr. Logan? In the spring, we will give an update on how our students are doing on the, on the map, on map testing so that you can look at growth that's uh, more as a formative um, and it's probably, it's a live, it's live data. Um, as I like to say, the, um, the data that we get from our summative assessments from the state are really, uh, we sometimes refer to them um, as, well, they're, they're data after the student has already left by the time we get that data. Um, for example, the students took the test last spring, but we still uh, don't have it. So um, that will be the next opportunity sometime in the spring. I think we will have two other cycles in by that time and we'll be able to see what the baseline was and then how they progressed during um, the next two uh, rounds of assessment. That's what I was expecting to hear. So thank you so much. That's, um, thank you so much. Mrs. Thank Comine? You. I have a OPS math night flyer. If you could. Awesome. And if, if you guys could tweet it out or put it on social media, I mean, I challenge everybody on the board to yeah. share that as well. I know you have your individual followers on social media. If you can do that, people at home, I'll do that. Um, that would it be is my highest liked tweet yet just so you know. Well, it, so I would things, be happy to retweet. retweet it took it. my followers over to another hundred. Can you so, do me a favor? Can you tag us all in that? So we I are, will figure out how we're to in do there that. And, and I expect a like and a retweet. I, I will. Okay. I, I promise you. I promise Thank you. you. Um, also, just FYI for the community, uh, the District Citizens Advisory Committee meeting is October 10th at 630 and it's now at the TAC building, correct? All right, so moving on to item J2B, bond program. Dr. Logan and Mr. Mark Summers. Please do not confuse him with me, Mark Snow. Uh, he's better looking. Uh, <laughs> uh, that's what Dr. Logan said. It's okay. Good evening. Uh, Mr. Summer, uh, Mr. Summer and I are going to do this uh, together um, on behalf of uh, Dr. Turnquist's uh, division in terms of the bond. And I will say that some of this I also actually also do because it helps me learn it and overlearn it, which is really important. Um, so as we get started, uh, obviously, you, you, as everyone knows, uh, uh, program start is, the, um, is current. And uh, we expect to finish the projects um, in, the, in the spring of 2023, or actually summer of 2023, 60 months over five years. And there are four groups of projects. I'm going to have Mark talk about each of those groups, uh, and then I will uh, kind of wrap it up uh, in terms of some things that, um, that will probably good be uh, important for parents um, on a more practical level in terms of how they're students will experience these projects. Uh, thank you. As uh, Dr. Logan mentioned, uh, the, the master schedule has a similar approach to the 2014 program where there's kind of waves or groupings of projects. Um, just reflecting back quickly, the overall master program is built with a few different factors, one of them being what can the marketplace handle, how do all these projects interface with all of the other district work going on, uh, other other activities or, or projects that might be similar how does it relate from a, a student assignment perspective and all the other uh, components that are inside of the district but um, the the first uh, grouping of projects uh, largely are related to uh, the deferred maintenance and then of course uh, the new construction uh, projects uh, Port Crook Elementary School the new high school at 60th and L and 156 in Ida those being the new construction projects, the other scopes are largely deferred maintenance uh, activities. Just moving in quickly into group uh, two, uh, the projects on this uh, group are very similar, some new construction and some deferred maintenance, again, trying to blend the balance of work overall. 
In addition to the deferred maintenance and new construction, there are some projects that also have uh, substantial additions uh, in this group to uh, that being Lewis and Clark. Uh, transitioning into a group number three, Again, these are largely grouped based on the start date of, of the design, not necessarily the finish of the project. Uh, at Adams Northwest and North in this group are largely deferred maintenance projects, the boilers, chillers, uh, motor replacements, a lot of the things that we've previously talked about. Uh, with uh, Morton being the exception of that, where they are going to have deferred maintenance work and then an addition to help uh, mitigate or remove portables at that location. And then really transitioning into the fourth group of projects, it's uh, kind of a pair. It just again, the way the scheduling works out, it leaves uh, Blackburn and South really kind of at the tail end of the project. Largely all, all deferred maintenance scope as well, boilers, chillers. Uh, just as a general note, uh, most of these projects aren't going to affect really student occupied spaces. So in the phase one master schedule, there was a lot of phasing and, and how do we work around the student body. A lot of the works associated in phase two are, are boiler room or central utility plant. They're really not an occupied student area. So we'll be able to do a lot of work or the contractors will during kind of the occupied time. That helps some of the overall schedule just so there isn't, uh, you know, gaps in time where we need to transition from space to space. So just as a side note uh, from the overall uh, project, that really makes up the large uh, groups of projects. because um, we with the two new high schools opening at the bottom you'll be able to see that students who are currently in the fifth or the sixth grade uh, in the 2018-2019 school year will attend the high school as either ninth or tenth graders in the 2022-23 uh, middle school and we've done the progression all along at the top you also will see the, when the other uh, schools will open as well so we have the new elementary school at Fort Crook in the 21-22 uh, school year uh, two new high schools will open simultaneously in 22-23 and also the site the elementary school at 10th and Pine and lastly uh, the Gateway Middle School which uh, site uh, Gateway, I'm sorry, I'm calling Gateway Middle School already. The new middle school, which is located on the same site as Gateway uh, Elementary School, adjacent to that elementary school, will uh, open in uh, 2023 um, and 2024. 2023-24 20, uh, school year. I'm going to have Mark talk a little bit about economic inclusion as a part of this on work as well. Yeah, uh, of course, as, as phase uh, two continues to or starts to ramp up, starting to get a lot of questions, of course, from small businesses and, and others um, asking from a student engagement perspective. So just put a couple of bullet points quick. Uh, all the things that we really established in phase one, we have all intentions of continuing on from academy and, and the outreach and, and just some of the different partnerships that were developed. Um, but as I said before, we don't want to rest on what was done there. We're constantly trying to innovate what other connections can we make? Uh, we're working hard on trying to identify some community-based partners, uh, as we've discussed, where we can leave program here with those community-based partners and they can continue it on. That'll really help the program move past the district, if you will, and, and further into the community and frankly past uh, Jacobs as well. And then the last piece, uh, something I'm the most excited about, we're really gonna focus a lot on a student engagement program um, and give it really the same uh, focus and emphasis that we did with the SEBs in the first uh, program, which was very successful. And it's really kind of about expanding the Jacobs Construction Academy into the schools and, and trying to provide exposure and opportunities all the way back to kiddos in elementary school. It's really a long game program from a workforce development perspective. It's not about you know everyone that's looking for a job tomorrow it's how do we feed the pipeline frankly for for companies like ours to be kind of selfish uh, and, and bring kids into design and construction and then taking it even beyond that and how do we help them they can stand up here and maybe do this for the bond program a couple of times and how do we teach them just about the business and the finance that runs you know the program and all the other things so um, a lot of excitement about that student engagement program. We look forward to in the future of getting some feedback from you folks on how that, how that needs to be shaped and crafted. We are very excited about the student engagement program. Um, as Mr. Summer said, the opportunity for students to, uh, to learn uh, skills and apply those skills while they are in high school 
with the goal that they will stay here in Omaha and then be able to contribute to the construction industry as in, in, um, in all its breadth and scope uh, because they will be exposed and will have opportunities to work um, side by side with uh, folks that are currently working in the field. So I, I see that very much, as Mark said, in the long game, really a, a more foundational process, although it's great to have uh, you know, their parents working and uh, folks in the community working. When you think about our, the diversity of our school students, this is an auto, this is a obviously a pretty straightforward way to know um, that you can uh, continue to diversify the workforce and to build the workforce, quite frankly, um, as we uh, experience a gray tsunami uh, in, um, in all of the construction and associated fields. And at this time, uh, we'll take questions. All righty. Uh, starting off, uh, Mr. Perlman. Uh, just one question I have. I, I think whenever this uh, topic of opening new buildings comes up, there's talk of how that's going to be implemented, whether it'll just be ninth grade, ninth or tenth, and so forth. Uh, can you, if, if you're able to, just ex explain if, I know we're years down the road, but also at, at the middle school level, are we thinking six through eight, five through eight, possibly for one of these, and, and how those are going to be rolled out? Thank you for your question. Um, in a typical high school opening, you open with ninth and 10th grade. Um, that is a current plan. Uh, we have not finalized any plans, but that is the current plan to have ninth and 10th graders in the buildings uh, during the first year for a lot of uh, kind of obvious reasons, a school connection and that kind of thing. You, if you don't have to uh, uproot uh, e um, 11th and 12th graders, uh, typically you try very hard not to. And that's the plan right now. In terms of the grade configuration for our grades uh, for middle school, the, uh, we are still also uh, flushing that out. I would say that you know preliminarily we're looking at six through eight uh, for the, the new building. Some of the five through eight um, has been done to alleviate overcrowding in some places, especially uh, in South uh, Omaha where we have students that either remain in schools for sixth grade. So for example, at Beals, uh, you have sixth graders that are remaining in their school uh, because of the overcrowding at, um, at Norris, for example. And so that's, where, that's kind of where we are um, with that. Um, but still making um, a decision. It's sometimes there's uniformity um, for an entire district. That is something that's still to be determined. The, it's not that we are, it's not like we have five to seven or we have six twelves. And so uh, we have pretty, we have a lot of uniformity, but that is an area that we're, we'll be exploring um, in um, the student assignment uh, committee. That, that had the right name for the committee. Thank you. One brief follow up. Uh, is there any, and this may still be to be determined, but any, uh, prospect of uh, new pre-Ks in these elementary schools? That has yet um, to be determined. Uh, they, the, just based on where the location is, there will obviously be a need for pre-K, uh, but it has, um, I'm not sure if that's in the ed specs. I don't want to speak, um, I, I just want to speak incorrectly, um, but we'll find the information out for you and get that to you. Thank you. Dr. Holman. Thank you. Will we get a more in-depth um, economic inclusion plan um, in regards to numbers and goals and, and what exactly is going to be happening with that? Mark, you want to answer that? Mark, I'm oh, sorry, Mr. Summer. Yes. <laughs> yeah. F follow up on that. Do, do you know when? Mm -hmm. <laughs> so uh, right now what we're focusing on is, is getting the first wave of projects kind of launched so we can start identifying uh, you know, what are the scopes of the project? What are the sizes of the project? So what, what goals would we kind of expect with those projects? And then kind of building a strategy around timing of outreach and again, all of the other kind of um, processes or, or kind of tools implemented along the way. We, we haven't gotten there yet, um, but I would expect in the next uh, six to eight weeks, we could have uh, an updated plan or at least here's the strategies we'd really like to try to implement as part of the, the next plan, get some feedback on those strategies and then kind of finalize. If you recall, 
of the board members that were here. We kind of worked through a plan. There was some feedback on that, and then we came back a second time and kind of presented a final uh, based on that input. So that, that if that approach works for the district, we'd gladly follow that. We had um, spoken, uh, Dr. Holman, about um, trying to have a plan uh, from um, our project manager, Jacobs, somewhere around December 1st, then allow for some feedback from um, the uh, from CBOC and from the board and try to have something uh, completely finalized uh, around the first of the year or around probably more likely around January 15th only because we lose some time um, with holidays um, uh, during the month of December but by January 15th having something flushed out um, I think that that was kind of what we kind of we discussed um, in terms of a, a plan but we definitely will um, want to have um, a preliminary for feedback and then a final um, enduring the, right around the first of the year. Thank, Thank you. you. You're welcome. Mrs. Gotti. First of all, I want to just thank you. I'm very excited about the um, Jacobs Construction Academy enhancement for students. I think that's wonderful. And I know we, as um, if you have a high schooler, you're getting other opportunities for the engineering and the design and architecture so this this is wonderful that it can be done within our schools which I think is a really good thing I have a couple of questions and I'm not sure um, when I think about the timing of the middle school because it's one of the last ones to open it so I don't know who the right person is to ask we talk about moving the sixth graders there but if the construction of the elementary schools is completed are we completing with still having portables so knowing that we're going to be moving sixth graders over to the middle school versus doing the middle school first and then it's so hard to know which way to go and so I guess I'm just curious to know what the thought process was on that and and how how that works because of not wanting to build too much capacity in the elementary side I'm going to have Mr. Ray answer that um, because it happened prior to my tenure so there's a lot of discussion on different options one of them like we did at Saddlebrook where we had more grades out of the elementary school when the uh, when it opened so I believe we had fifth and sixth grade at Saddlebrook for a short time period we've discussed options of opening those two new elementary schools with a, a larger grade configuration and which allows um, the sixth grade which would be the fifth graders to move into the new building so it wouldn't be a matter of it'd be just the next fifth grade class moving into that building but possibly using a sixth grade class at both those elementary schools so not overbuilding capacity at the elementary schools when we know we're moving kids out correct correct I think that's yep. what the public just wants to make sure mm -hmm. that we're not doing um, and those plans would be presented to the board um, as dr. Logan has mentioned uh, we're still in the planning stages right. and that would come to the board with the full plan right perfect thanks and then I think Mr. Summers, I'm going to call on you because you always answer this well for me and it's a question as I know that you know I get on a regular basis from my constituents and so I'd just like to have you explain the answer publicly once and then maybe I'll just send your clip out. Um, can you explain to the public why our high school will open two years later than the Elkhorn School even though the vote was only three months different? What, what caused that to be? A, and I've been kind of explaining to folks, but I know you do a very nice job of sharing how that happens. Sure, I, I'll, I'll do my best attempt. Of course, I don't know all the details of the Elkhorn plan or, or um, many of them, but I, there's a couple of things, two or three main things that we, we see different. Uh, one is just the, just the overall status of the, the high school design, for example. Um, it's our understanding that when uh, Elkhorn's bond was passed, their design was either largely done or done. Um, the, the high school designs, of course, in phase one were, was done at a conceptual level, so the full design process still needs to occur. Uh, we're targeting it about 10 or 11 months from, uh, for, for the, the two high schools that OPS is working on. So there's a, a kind of a, a difference. Um, the second piece is we've talked about a little bit about site development. Uh, both of the sites that the district uh, procured, they both need to be developed to, to actually build on um, some, so the 156 Anita site just requires contouring and, and just moving of earth to prepare it for new construction. Of course, the 60th and L Street site requires abatement of the existing facility and then demolition of that building. So a little bit different circumstances, if I understand it. Um, 
I, I think Elkhorn did a small site package or did a site package, so ultimately when their bond referendum passed, they were ready to build on that property. That site development work has to happen inside of the district schedule. And then the other component is uh, the district uh, building currently, uh, the new high school is about 285,000 square feet. Uh, the high school that Elkhorn is approximately 254, 255,000 square feet. So just the sheer size of the high schools are different. And then specifically at 156 and Ida Street, that de delta is without the YMCA factored in. So um, don't have an exact square footage of that. Still discussions of, of how that's going to unfold in the building. But it's just more square footage to build. It's more site to move around. It's more of everything, including time. Uh, the only other thing I would mention is just we're really trying to be smart about the marketplace and not try to put the district in a position of forcing contractors or their partners to, to make poor decisions and commit to things that we just know not possible and then committing to the public things that are going to be very, very difficult. Uh, planning to finish the schools in the springtime to really give the district an opportunity to fully move in from an FF&E perspective. And then there are going to be new buildings and, and staff members and administrators are so really wanting to make sure they have an opportunity to settle in so they're not learning where the restroom is the same time new students are. So all of those factors, you know, we really feel that the schedule the district has is on, on, on mark. Not what the other districts are doing isn't. That's their plan, you know, with what they kind of had in place. Uh, we just, again, feel this is the best solution for the district. Thank you. You said that much more eloquently than I have been. So thank you very sure. much because I've been getting that question a lot. Um, the last question I have is really for um, Dr. Logan, and it was something she and I spoke about, which uh, I had asked about either a district committee or um, a group of individuals or someone that would be um, responsible for design consistency across the district so that we would ensure that um, every building was built with consistency. So she explained to me what she's going to be doing and I would like her to explain to the rest of the board. One of the things that we are doing with the second bond is having one position that we are using uh, kind of uh, probably more known as kind of a construction ombudsman. Um, that person will uh, uh, report to uh, Dr. Turnquist um, and have a dotted line to me in terms of being able to um, uh, respond to concerns regarding uh, any sort of uh, construction issues that are going on and obviously work uh, collaboratively with uh, Mr. Summer um, and his team um, at Jacobs uh, but be our eyes and ears on the ground uh, um, for the project and also be a an op be, have it to be an opportunity for uh, the ombudsman kind of duties where you can kind of uh, talk about things that maybe things are going on through the design process that you have concerns about and bring it to that individual's attention um, and we I would work with Mark and obviously Dr. Turnquist uh, to make sure that those things are ironed out so um, that's that's what we're doing for the second bond. I really want to thank you for that because it's not something that happened in the first phase and I can see the real benefit now on the back side so I appreciate very much your attention to that. Uh, thank you. I think that we. I just want to. We we are still going to have our design teams at our schools uh, because the the school input uh, in the process is uh, has been uh, remarkable, and I think it definitely a lot of value add. I think Mr. Summers would agree with having the school buy in to what the design and the final outcome are. And but we also know that some things always get lost in the sauce, uh, so to speak. And this will be an opportunity to work. Uh, with uh, Dr. Turnquist, her team, with Mark, um, and then to make a presentation in conjunction with, uh, so I won't have to be over there anymore, this person would do that with uh, Mr. Summer um, uh, on behalf of the board. Thank you. Mr. Scanlon? <clears throat> uh, just to touch on uh, uh, Mr. Perlman's uh, comment about early education, um, we do have a lot of community partnerships uh, that uh, together we've been working with uh, for early education and uh, I don't know if everybody's aware but the uh, Kennedy Early Learning Center down on 30th and Bedford roughly in that area right next to Howard Kennedy uh, they are breaking ground and and moving uh, moving moving dirt and starting that process and I think that uh, is definitely something to look forward um, 
our new elementary schools as, as they go up if, if it makes sense to have early learning centers that we can try to um, work with the Sherwood Foundation to to help us out with that uh, uh, early education I think that's definitely something that we 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 should be open to as a district um, to, to partner with them and then a um, the question for uh, Mark Summers um, I know when we've had the existing schools that we've renovated during the first phase we didn't have any new um, uh, non-existent school I, I mean we we built new schools that were existing facilities. replacement thank you mm -hmm. um, and it's kind of on that last one the student engagement program mm -hmm. when we go to have new schools how do we or how is it uh, planned to get student input and student engagement when we don't necessarily have any students at that site does that well, make sense yeah I think um, we'll, we'll probably take a little bit of a, a, a page out of how we're handling the involvement from the principal level we're trying to engage the, the principals that are in adjacent buildings just from a community and, and kind of neighborhood perspective uh, and then broadening that to the executive director a perspective as well um, and actually during the conceptual design work for the two high schools we did work really closely with with uh, the students and those those principals were very active and very comfortable saying yes here, here's access to the kiddos uh, we, we did a, a couple different um, you know brainstorming and, and and discussions with them and talks about lockers or are they part of the future school and what was feedback from students and tried to make it really practical too not just Kind of grandiose architecture but day-to-day -day things what are going to impact the students but um, I think we'll you know from, from our perspective you know the district staff and those building principals know those kiddos the best uh, and we'll work with them on how to, how to best engage them and what are the right opportunities and then try to dovetail that in with other curricular activities going on uh, again just to make it practical and tangible I guess when you when you bring back the economic inclusion that other everybody was asking about um, if you could bring back um, examples from the first phase of how sure. the uh, student engagement yeah. uh, program worked and how successful it was and, and how you plan on doing it in the second phase, I, I'd be interested to okay. hear about that. No problem. Mrs. Gotti. I would just like to follow up on the student engagement piece of the design process. Mm -hmm. um, for both the 60th and L site and the 156th and I decide, I would like to see the students who actually live in the attendance mm -hmm. area be a part of that um, and they're spread out throughout the district um, mm -hmm. at different schools but I think that that really brings engagement home um, to where it's where those schools are going to be built so I would appreciate that mm -hmm. well um, thank you uh, for your comments and questions just uh, an update there will be quarterly updates about this uh, for the board uh, I think the next update is in January um, but I'm going to task uh, Dr. Logan uh, to come back to the board with a uh, I don't think we've really approved or saw a process on how we're going to name schools and do all that uh, which is going to be very political in our community um, I'm sure everybody's received emails and letters about already naming a school before we even broke ground um, but uh, if you could come back in the future Dr. Logan with a process that you think will be fit best on how to engage the community and how we would uh, facilitate that um, because I mean we are going to be naming a school eventually um, soon uh, 33rd and Burt so um, that's one piece and then also an update about the YMCA partnership I believe we haven't signed a contract but an MOU so what does that look like moving forward and what is the wise part on that um, when you do your next update thank you Absolutely, um, President Snow, and the school located right across the street in Gifford Park I certainly will uh, give you that information um, to you very soon. Thank you. Moving on to item J2C, academic calendar. Mr. Scott, Smith, Bonnie. Oh, man, sorry about that. It's okay. Good evening. Um, as was mentioned, I'm here to provide information on the 1920-2021 calendars and the process by which they were developed. Uh, 
Star Wars effect here rolling. Okay. Uh, so it's kind of a four-step process that we go through. The first thing we do is to give something uh, for people to talk about, so to speak, by moving the concepts from the 1718 and 1819 calendars forward and fitting them to the arrangement of days that will make up the academic calendars for these two years. Uh, the next step is to collect uh, feedback from as many stakeholders and interested parties as we possibly can. Uh, the third step is my personal favorite, integrating all of those um, various and often opposed suggestions. Um, and then the final process is to bring before this board a proposed calendar for your consideration. This year we had unprecedented response to our call for uh, comment on the calendars to the community. Uh, we had nearly 7,000 responses uh, to the survey that went up, out, up from 163 last year. Um, I should note the process was very similar, uh, but we do have many thanks owed to our district communication colleagues for assisting us in getting the word out. Um, we additionally received around 6,000 comments on the various components of the calendar that were reviewed uh, for thematic consistency and to identify the concerns and interests of our communities. Overall, there was strong consensus for the calendar I bring before you today. Um, the questions that were provided to the community included uh, their level of agreement uh, or the accuracy of the placement of various key dates on the calendar, as well as any comments they would like to make. Results were very favorable for all placements on the calendar. In addition to reaching out to the community, we had opportunity to meet with numerous stakeholder groups. Uh, the OEA was very kind enough to uh, let me come and visit their board meeting and to have discussions about their interests on the calendar. We also spoke with 226 leadership, uh, affected district level administrators, and finally before executive council to make sure that everything was functional with the calendars as they were moving forward. There are some changes to the calendar this year. Uh, we're still starting on a Wednesday. I initially suggested maybe a Monday start uh, that met with, I would say, a considerable amount of scrutiny from our various constituent groups. Um, no one thought that was a great idea, and so we moved back to a Wednesday start. Um, additionally, for the 1920 school year, we were unfortunately had to cut down our new teacher training to four days due to co a contract issue. I won't go into too many details, but the issue being our contracts change on August 1st. If we had the five days for new teacher training, that would push us into July 31st, which would cause administrators to have to come back at those buildings to, to be available, etc. cetera. Um, that could cause some challenges for those teachers. Um, so in Kind of recognition of that, we added a half day teacher work day, uh, and that is the Friday before Labor Day, you'll note on the calendars provided. Uh, the third change, or I guess fourth, tick these all together, uh, is that we split the second secondary level second conferences. That's a tongue twister. Uh, they were previously on the same week where you had middle school and high school going at the same time. That created a, a number of challenges for families and the district. Uh, and so we have rectified that in these two proposed calendars for 1920 and 2021. Additionally, uh, through the great feedback we received, we were able to uh, come up with some improvements to the, the calendar and the distribution process. Uh, the first being a simplification for the various stakeholders who look for the calendar, um, though it may be somewhat more complex on the district side, which is to say we'll create a multitude of calendars. You'll still have your master calendar that everyone is used to, but then we'll also have uh, different calendars by stakeholder group. So families at the elementary, middle, and high school level will have specific calendars to their needs and interests, though they can still get the master calendar. That way, at a quick glance, you can see whether or not your student has school on Friday or, or what whatever day may be of interest um, without having to, to go to the key and discern all that information now. That will provide an additional opportunity through that simplification, especially for families, and, and I should mention we'll have calendars for staff at those levels as well. Um, but for families, that will create an additional space that we've reached out to the stakeholders who are in charge of the three critical district initiatives currently, specifically the math plan, our um, attendance plan and uh, crisis management to be able to provide a level appropriate bit of advertisement in that additional open space given that uh, the calendars often reside on folks fridge that gives a good opportunity for visibility of those key messages to those groups at those areas 
Uh, finally, we are looking to bring our calendars into the digital age by providing file types that would be available for download to update folks' smart devices, as well as their Outlook calendars and any other calendar type. Um, that was actually a recommendation that came from a member of the OEA board, so many thanks to them for that. Um, and thanks to Rob Dixon for giving me a, a tutorial on what these files would look like and the process that would be required there. So those are the, that's the presentation for the calendar. I open myself to your questions. Thank you. Um, real quick, just off your previous comment about the for the smartphone, will these calendars be able to be translated not just to English and Spanish, but into those various languages that most smartphones can translate? Correct. We have reached out to the ESL department to provide translation support into as many languages as we can get out that, in front of our families. I know that put, put, uh, potentially help us with, you know, when we look at attendance and really letting a lot of our families know uh, when they have school and when they don't have school, especially some of our new immigrant families. Um, I'll open up to the board. Mrs. Gotting. Well, I want to thank you because I think about where we were four years ago on doing calendars and we've You've moved us um, you. miles ahead, and I've already called your boss today and said, oh, I think Mr. Schmidt Bonnie did a phenomenal job getting these calendars pulled together. So kudos Thanks to you me. and for and to communications for getting the survey out. And I think that's what we always really wanted to know is how, um, especially on the parent-teacher conferences, we never really knew how people felt. And so now we have good um, data to show and I know Mrs. Faye isn't here, but she and I, um, as you know, we're always hammering on those April teacher work days because, and, and you did a phenomenal job to get it to the days when our, we have a significant number of teachers gone anyway. And so um, academic instruction will not be lost um, on kids during that day, which always was bothersome to me as a parent um, of a child. So I just want to thank you for all the work that you did and for what a phenomenal um, approach you've been able to it really bring the uh, district calendar from where it was to where it's at now. Thank you so much. Mr. Perlman. I too want to thank you. Uh, this, this incredible amount of work that goes into this. I just have a question on, on one part of it that I'm, I'm, it's, I'm sure it's me. I'm having a hard time understanding. The part where it talks about no school for non-entry grades at secondary. Oh, sure. Um, my first question is, so does that mean that there is only school that day for uh, students who are in 10th, 11th, and 12th, and also 7th, 8th as well? You're correct. So those upperclassmen, sophomores, and above would not be in attendance at high school, and those 7th and 8th, including 6th in our 5-8 middle school. So it would just be that entry-level class at middle school and high school. It gives them the run of the building for a day uh, so that teachers can focus on their needs and make sure that they're able to find their classes, work the lockers, things of that nature. So is there, is there a middle school that has a, just 7th and 8th grade? Yes, we still have some. Oh, okay, I did. Correct. Lewis and Clark, for example, would, uh, well, they have a partial 6th grade. And so on that first day, I believe at Lewis and Clark, you'd have 6th and 7th in attendance given the small 6th grade. Okay. And so that first day would include both of those. But we'll seek to clarify that in the final calendar. That's a good point. And then uh, the, there's three of the same grade, but they're probably the same grade because they're progression and not same progression. Of that. Well, most of that was due to a PDF issue. I can send you the Excel document where the coloration stayed a little bit cleaner. Well, as long as it's one, two, three, I think it's easy enough to understand. So the second day would be everyone else at the schools. You the third it. day would be the pre-K. Perfect. So that's simple enough. Got it. Thanks. Absolutely. Anybody else? And just another thing, um, this is something just to look into the future mm -hmm. when you start using a lot of colors. We do have some students and community members that are colorblind, so some of these mm -hmm. colors might blend together. So actually adding a shape to them could really help blues and purples so I have green red color issues myself so I'm very sensitive to that comment thank, thank you. you all right thank you so much Absolutely. and I believe this will be on the October 15th agenda correct moving on to J2D policy 5423 non-service animals uh, and policy 5427 therapy animals
Mr. Ray. Thank you. Um, the two policies are um, policies, well first, 5423 was in front of the board on a previous date. Uh, Mrs. Godding had some questions about the strike through uh, parts of the policy, so this went through the policy committee uh, with the strike throughs and the red additions. Um, so 5423 is just strictly information, so if you have an opportunity to review. Um, this was given as hard copy at the last board meeting. Um, and this is the first time that it's on the agenda in this format. The second uh, policy is therapy animals, which is a new policy. Um, it, it's not based on any current policy or previous policy. It's a brand new policy uh, that was requested by several different building level uh, people and as well as Dr. Logan. Um, so this policy is also brought to you as information and will be a first reading on the 15th and then a second reading on uh, November 5th. So again, it, it, between now and the next board meeting, if you have suggestions or any input, uh, don't hesitate to let me know. Again, this went through the policy committee as a uh, first draft, and 5427 is a brand new policy. Thank you, Mr. Ray. There is no receipt of reports. Um, I will now entertain a motion to uh, go into closed session. I move that the Board of Education go into closed session for the protection of the public interest and for the prevention of needless injury to the reputation of individuals to discuss with the superintendent, secretary to the board, and legal counsel pending litigation, personnel, and legal advice. There's a motion on the floor by Vice President America. Is there a second? Second. Second by Mr. Smith. Roll call, please. Holman. Aye. America. Aye. Perlman. Aye. Ryan. Aye. Scanlon. Aye. Smith. Aye. Snow. Aye. Cassidy. Aye. Godding. Eight aye. Let me remind, uh, motion carries. <laughs> Let me remind the board that the purpose for closed session is for the protection of the public interest and for the prevention of needless injury to the reputation of individuals to discuss with the superintendent, secretary to the board, and legal counsel. Pending litigation, personnel, and legal advice. Uh, let the record reflect the board went into closed session at 816.